Welcome to the Askeville Assembly of God Sermon Podcast. We're so glad you've taken the time to listen, and we pray this message from our pastors will be a blessing on your life this week. If you've got your Bibles today, I want you to turn to Luke, the book of Luke, chapter 1. We're going to go to the very beginning part of Luke chapter 1. If you're here today, and maybe this is your first time or first time in a long time, you've come on a great Sunday. You are here at the, uh, at the first episode of a significantly long series. A few months ago, I was praying about what to do in 2023. And as I was praying and as I was asking the Lord what direction He wanted us to go, I, I just kept coming back to the idea of Luke, the book of Luke. And I felt like, now Lord willing, listen, I still reserve the right to wake up any Sunday, Pentecostally by dream, and change the sermon. Okay? All right. But I, for the foreseeable future, we're going to be preaching through the book of Luke. The book of Luke is a very significant one, especially for us Gentiles, and I don't know any Jews in the room. Luke is a very significant figure, and I hope by the end of this day... You will agree with me as well. As I was doing much, much research on this, I saw many ministers, great men of God, who said that they have never heard a sermon on the man, Luke. And so here I am giving you one of those cool sermons. Before we get into his life, I want to... Often when we listen to a sermon or we read a book or we go to the Bible, we immediately start asking, what's in it for me? What does this mean to me? Why do I need to hear this? What is this for me? And I want you to put that on hold for a second. I want us to take a minute and look at the significance of God choosing Luke to write one of the four accounts of his son's life. I want us to talk about Luke as a man and his decision, his perspective, what it was that he wanted to get across in his message, the gospel. You see, gospels aren't biographies. They're not biographies. They're not meant to tell the story of the person. They're meant to make a point about the person they're talking about. The Gospels are all aimed at a specific audience. Jesus is the subject, but all of them have different perspectives that they're pointing at. Mark is a get-to-the-point kind of guy. If you want a quick run through of the Gospel, go to Mark. Mark, I'm pretty sure, was heavily influenced by Peter. It's a get-to-the-point kind of Gospel. Let's talk about it. Let's go. Um, and so, uh, if, you will, if, you want, if you want a quick understanding of Jesus' life, go to the book of Mark. If you want to see it from the Jewish perspective, go to the book of Matthew. I'll never forget a few years ago, um, actually it was on my first trip to Israel on my way back. There was a man, a rabbi, who sat beside me. And that rabbi uh, asked me what I was doing there. And I said, you know, I've been to the Holy Land. I wanted to see all these things. I'm a Christian. I'm a pastor back in, North, in, in America. And, He was like, oh, that's great. So what kind of sights did you want to see as a Christian? And I told him, you know, we went to Galilee and then all through Jerusalem. And he was like, oh, oh, yeah, that's right, Jesus and all. And I was like, yeah, yeah. He said, I said, "Um, so you're a rabbi? And he was like, yes. And he was sitting there studying the whole time. And I was trying to go to sleep, but he kept talking to me. And as he was studying, I said, "Um, so if you don't mind me asking, like, what do you preach about? If you're a rabbi, what do you talk about? And he says, we talk about the Talmud a lot. We talk about the sayings of the Old Testament. We, we talk, I, I teach them straight from the book. And I said, right, but does, does Jehovah speak anymore? Does, is, he, is Yahweh speaking anymore or anything like that? And he said, there's a few rabbis that say they hear something. And we take some of their thoughts. But, you know, it was really in the Old Testament. It's in the Torah. And so we just teach the Torah. And I said, well, okay, I'm sorry. Let me just ask you one more question. What's next for you? What, what are you looking forward to? And he said, our coming Messiah. And I was like, oh, cool. What, do you mind telling me what your coming Messiah would look like? And he said, yes. He'll be a man of peace and of love. He'll be a man who preaches love. And the more he preaches love, the more people will hate him. And the very people he'll come to save will come against him. He'll be a man who suffers a lot in his life. But he's willing to lead because he's going to be a sacrificial man full of love. And that's what he'll preach. And he'll come to us one day. And he'll even go to Jerusalem. And there he will unite all those that are under God. And everybody else will be displaced. That's the person we're waiting on. I got so excited. (laughs) 
I tried to calm myself down. I tried to, I took deep breaths while he was talking. I said, brother, he's already come, man. I know exactly who you're looking for. I can tell you, please, if you'll just open the Bible to Matthew and just read the book of Matthew. And he goes, oh, no, no, we don't read, we don't read other religions' books. And I said, bruh. That's a red flag right there. If you're not willing to see another perspective, maybe already people knew that the perspective you had was not good enough. I said, your Torah says you ought to have sacrifices. The last sacrifice that was made was almost 2,000 years ago, right after Jesus Christ fulfilled the entire debt. You might need to go to Matthew. He moved seats and I never saw him again. Suddenly, this packed plane had another seat uh, way up front where I never talked to him again. I pray for him, though. Here's what I know. If you, if you have a conversation with a Jewish person, point them to Matthew. Matthew does a mira- an, an, an inspired job of connecting all the dots of the Old Testament to explain that Jesus is, exa- is exactly who they've been looking for. John is on a cosmic level in another world. John is a man who's a big, big thinker. Remember, he's the dude we got revelation from, right? He saw some stuff in there that we can't understand 2,000 years later. We feel like we are experts on every other part of the Bible, but revelation we all throw big... I don't know. And John wrote his gospel the same way. He begins with, in the beginning, the Logos was with God. The Logos, that's a Greek idea. He... In the beginning was the Word, the Logos. And the Word was with God and the Word was. He pulls on all these these big, huge ideas and he wraps them all together and talks about how Jesus is the answer from the very beginning. But Luke, Luke doesn't make a whole lot of sense. See, Luke never saw Jesus with his own eyes. Jesus wasn't a follower. I mean, Luke wasn't a follower of Jesus in the flesh. He was a second generation believer. He also wasn't a Jewish guy. Luke is most likely a Greek, a Gentile. The closest thing to us. Luke's message is one that is meant for our ears to hear and understand who Jesus really was. A few weeks ago, I had a friend of mine who said, I wish that somebody would just compile a book with all the information about Jesus in one spot. I wish they'd put all, all, all the gospel said and put it all in one, one compilation. And right after he said that, I read these words. Luke chapter 1, verses 1 through 4. I thought this was interesting. Listen. Luke says, Inasmuch as many have undertaken... Now, Luke knows that many have tried to write a story of Jesus. He, he's not writing his own, like thinking he's in a vacuum or something. He knows there's a bunch of them. He says, Inasmuch as many have undertaken to compile a narrative of the things that has been accomplished among us, just as those from the beginning who were, check this word out, eyewitnesses. Now, he wasn't a witness. He wasn't an eyewitness, but he interviewed those who were. Luke is a second generation journalist. He goes to the people who saw Jesus and compiled their stories together. Now you've got to ask yourself, is Luke worth listening? Is he worthy of our trust to hear his story? Because Luke is writing down Mary's story. He interviewed Mary. Without Luke, we don't have the birth story of Jesus. Without Luke, we don't have the upper room. We don't have Paul's conversion. We don't have any of the acts without Luke. And so we have to ask ourselves, is Luke worthy to be listened to? Why are there all these other gospels? Why should we listen to Luke? Maybe we should ask the question, why not? Why not listen to Luke? What about his life makes him unworthy to be listened to? We'll get to that in a second. Just as those from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word have delivered them to us. Luke writes, it seemed good to me also 
having followed all things closely for some time past. Luke took some time. He didn't write this on a whim. He took some time. He listened. Luke was maybe the most intellectual person in the church at that time. Him and Paul probably intellectually sparred off more than anybody else because they were intelligent dudes. I wonder how the story went when Jesus made it back to heaven after resurrection. Jesus, God the Father welcomes and way to go, son. You did a great job. Everything we wanted to accomplish. Everybody has been redeemed. But uh, those boys you got down there. Yeah, dad. Uh, what are, they're not real bright, are they? I sent you down there to get 12 of them, and you went and got a bunch of fishermen. And I mean, you did get one tax collector. Good job. Those boys ain't going to get a whole lot done, are they? Why don't you go back and... Why don't you find Paul? Saul at the time, who was murdering every Christian he could. I'm not saying this is how it happened. This isn't in the Bible. I'm just saying. He comes down and... Saul miraculously gets saved, becomes Paul. Paul, years later, finds a, a Greek dude named Luke. What an intellectual he was. And I'll, I'll tell you why I know that he's intellectual. He said, I followed these things closely for some time. It seemed good to me to write an orderly account for you. And then he says who he's writing it to, Theophilus. That you may have certainty concerning the things you have been taught. So Luke took a lot of time. He listened to all the stories. He most likely read Mark and Matthew. And then he decided what information was key for the Greek audience that he was writing to. Then he compiled the entire story. The orderly account, as he put it, he put the orderly account together that he thought was most essential for every person to listen to. And so after my friend said he wished he had a, a, a volume of all the information, I know what he was saying. But what hit me was Luke understood that what he had written was everything we needed to know about this guy, Jesus. So that's why I want to talk about Luke. Because it's our gospel. Matthew wrote to the Jews. Paul, I'm sorry, Luke wrote to us. This is our gospel. He knew that there would be Gentile believers that needed to know why Jesus related to them. So why Luke? Many tried and he felt needed to compile a work together. Luke's gospel is the most complete narrative of all the stories of Jesus, it is the most complete narrative of Jesus' life out of the four Gospels. The Gospel of Luke is the longest book in the New Testament. The Gospel of Luke is the longest book in the New Testament. He took his time to write an orderly account and put as much information as he possibly could in there. In fact, I read one scholar say that he had to stop where he did in the book of Luke because it wouldn't have fit anymore on parchment. The scrolls. So then he stopped there and went into Acts. Y'all know how Acts begins exactly the way Luke does. He talks about, hey, Theophilus, I'm writing this to you to help your faith and encourage you. And then when he ends Acts, he just abruptly ends again. Some believe that he was actually trying to write a third volume. I believe we are the third volume. I believe what we are doing right now is the continuation of what Paul, I mean, sorry, of what Luke was sent to tell us about. What God started in Jerusalem and continued on throughout the world, we are the world that it continued out to be for. The, the scope of Luke is from heaven above. At the very beginning of the book of Luke, we see angels are, are coming down to tell about God is speaking to Zechariah. He's telling about what's getting ready to take place. John the Baptist is being born. This huge thing from heaven to earth. He's born in Bethlehem. And then we know he goes to, uh, to Egypt for a little while. And then he goes to Nazareth and lives. And then he, he ministers in all of Galilee. And then he ministers on his way down. As, if you look at the, uh, the book of Luke, that's how it works. He goes to Bethlehem, then he, he lives. 
lives up in Nazareth, and then he ministers in all of Galilee, and then he, he, he ministers through Perea, is what it says in the book of Luke, but he ministers all through the middle section, all on his way into Jericho, and then eventually Jerusalem, where when he gets to Jerusalem, he is uh, uh, accused and killed. He, he is crucified there, resurrected, and at the very end of the book of Luke, he says, go and tarry ye in Jerusalem until you be endued with power. The promise of the Father will come upon you. And so the scope of Luke is from heaven's glory all the way down to Jerusalem. But do y'all remember what Jerusalem, what, do you remember what the book of Acts' focus was? He says, go to Jerusalem, be ter- tarry there until you be in due with power, and then I'll send you from Jerusalem to Judea, to Samaria, to the ends of the world. So the gospel of God, the, the good news of God comes from heaven above. And this moment he comes down, he is born, he goes throughout the land of Israel where God called him to be. And then he takes the book of Acts and takes him to the world. And we're the fulfillment of that. We're the fulfillment of the rest of the world. Many of us sit in this very place because somebody saw that Askeville was the world and needed Jesus. A lady by the name of Snow White saw this overgrown anthill needed a Pentecostal church. Thank God. Thank God she planted in Windsor and in here and in Perrytown. What good can come from Perrytown? (laughs) We got a few of you. I'm just kidding. The scope of the book of Luke goes from the the magnitude of heaven all the way down to Jerusalem, the cross, the, the, the tomb. And then Acts turns the funnel around the other way and he says, from Jerusalem to Judea, to Samaria, to all the parts of the world. And we are in that. We continue to fulfill the book of Acts. It's the longest book in the New Testament. There are 20 miracles. Six of them are unique to Luke. There are 24 parables in the book of Luke. uh, 18 of them are unique to the book of Luke. Luke tells 18 of the parables alone. There's 24 altogether in the book, but he tells 18 by himself. Do you understand that without the book of Luke, we wouldn't have the Good Samaritan? He's the only one who records the Good Samaritan. Now, I wonder why that is. Why would Matthew leave out the Good Samaritan? We don't want Samaritans being the good guy, do we? Without Luke, we, would have, we wouldn't have the prodigal. Perhaps the most famous story in the history of the world. Without Luke's gospel, we don't have the prodigal. Again, why would Matthew leave that out? Well, that was a harsh rebuke on the Jews, wasn't it? The older brother. I'm not saying he meant to leave it out, but I'm just saying it's interesting that Luke made sure it got in. Without Luke, we have no songs. When you read Luke chapter 1 and Luke chapter 2, you see Mary wrote a song. You see Zechariah had a song. You see Simeon sing. You hear the angels sing. Glad ty- uh, 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 What is it? In the sky, happy stuff. Go read it. Luke ta- chapter 2. Okay? He's better with words than me. Whatever. All right. But Luke records the songs in the New Testament. Matthew doesn't. Uh, Mark doesn't. John doesn't. It's Luke. Luke takes the time to hear Mary's story. Listen, Luke was a physician. He was a doctor. When Matthew wrote about the the birth of Jesus, he only talks about the dude's story. He mentions a lineage. And then he hears what happened to Joseph and what happened to the wise men who came and all that kind of stuff. He pieces together the the story of Christmas through, through the men. But Luke... He revels in an old lady getting pregnant, Elizabeth. He takes time to talk about what Mary pondered in her heart when she was just a teenager and found out that she was going to carry the Lord. He listens to her story. He writes it down. And she puts in there, she said, I pondered and treasured these things, which means that most likely Mary never told anybody else. Perhaps no one had ever asked 
And Luke took the time to sit down with elderly Mary and say, Tell me your story. Are you thankful for Luke? Luke wrote the book of Luke and the book of Acts, Paul's companion. In Colossians chapter 4, 14, Paul calls Luke his beloved physician, his friend, his doctor. In 2 Timothy 4, 11, the last words that, that Paul would write in his life, Tim, uh, Paul writes to Timothy and says, Only Luke is with me. At the end of his life, all he had was Luke who was with him. Luke was an eyewitness to Paul and chronicled the other eyewitnesses. For Luke, we get the inside story of Jesus' birth from Mary. You know, I heard a comedian, Mark Lowry, once said, he said, if anybody knew that Mary was a virgin, Mary did. He was a comedian, by the way. Okay, that was supposed to be funny. The only, the only person who wrote in the scripture that he was virgin birth was Luke. And he got the story from Mary. Now you've got to decide whether or not Luke is worthy of listening to or Mary's worthy of listening to. But that's where the story comes from. Luke was not there. He heard the story from Mary. And if anybody knew, she did. Can you imagine hearing Mary's story? Can you imagine hearing Paul's testimony for the thousandth time? Luke's heard it so much, I think he puts it in Acts three different times. He keeps writing it in on habit. Luke was unique because he was a Greek historian. He, was a, he had the historian bent on how to write Many people who look at literature say that Luke's gospel is the best literature that was written during the first century. He was a Greek historian. He knew how to write perfect Greek. An orderly account by the eyewitnesses. The Greek people, the Greek philosophy as we know it, Socrates, Plato, and all those guys, they were on the lookout for the universal man. They created a philosophy that believed that they could create and build the perfect human. The perfect man. The universal man as they called it. And Luke, his whole purpose of writing the gospel was to give the argument that Jesus is the universal man that the Greeks have always been looking for. The fulfillment of Greek philosophy is Jesus Christ. The fulfillment of the Hebrew theology is Jesus Christ. Jesus is the fulfillment of what everybody all over the world at any time has been looking for. And that's what Luke said. Luke gives us the fulfillment of the Greeks. While Matthew gives us fulfillment of Messiah from the Jews. Jesus is the universal man. He's perfect in the power of the Holy Spirit. The second thing he was, was he's a physician. Luke was a physician. He was a, a, a scientist. He was so intelligent as a scientist that uh, he used more medical terms in the gospel of Luke. He used more medical terms in the gospel of Luke than the father of medicine, Hippocrates, used in all of his writings. Luke called out what specific ailments people dealt with because he knew the ailments that they dealt with. He also, when he talked about the lady that, uh, with the issue of blood, he leaves out the point that she let, you know, wasted all of her money on doctors. He did leave that out. Right? He said probably wasted her money somewhere else. No, I'm just kidding. He, he didn't say anything. He just left that point out. We don't want to put anything hard on the doctors. It's clear that he's a physician. He used proper medical terms for ailments. He mentioned Jesus' comment. He's the only one who did. Who mentioned when Jesus said about being the physician. Jesus said, I'm the great physician. And nobody else mentions that. Luke is the only one who mentions it. Luke also uses the word salvation a lot. And if you look at the Greek of what the word salvation means. It actually means healing. It means an inner Healing. As we see physically, Luke understood it to be what happens inwardly. He says it over and over again. The third thing is he was a poet. He records the songs and he was the parable king. He had more parables than any of the other gospels. So who was Luke's audience? We was. 
He originally said, I'm sending it to Theophilus. The friend of God or the lover of God is another way you could say the name Theophilus. We know that Theophilus was a Gentile. Most likely a Roman who was well off, may have even paid Luke to to take the time to write these documents out. But he was a man struggling with his faith. He wanted a firm foundation and he needed it in a way that he could understand it. And he couldn't understand it from these Jewish perspectives. So he asked Luke to help and Luke was happy to help Theophilus in his faith. Good news. So the the focus that that he had was was the Greek people, the Greek-minded people. Luke traces Jesus... Matthew traces Jesus back to Abraham. Luke traces Jesus back to Adam, the father of all. The one that all people come from. That's where, that's where uh, Luke's, gospel, Luke's gospel takes him all the way back to Adam. Luke focuses on the outsider, the foreigner, the woman, the poor. And good news for all people. All that are afar off. That's what it says in Acts. This promise is for you. For your children and all that are afar off. How many of y'all know some far off people that need the Holy Spirit? (laughs) Not just far off from Jesus, but far off. You know what I'm saying? (laughs) Luke is a Gentile who writes to Gentiles. It's the best Greek in the New Testament. He wrote with the best Greek in the New Testament. The long time searchings of the Greek philosophy were to construct and inform the perfect person. Sadly... The more Greek attached him, uh, the more the Greek attached themselves to the world, the more unseen. I'm so sorry. The more the Greek attached himself to his world, the more the unseen became a dim world. The more they tried to make the perfect man, figure out who the perfect man was, the more they attempted to do that the darker their perspective got. The Greeks more and more went into darkness the more they tried to perfect themselves because they would not rely on the understanding that there was something outside of this world. The only way we can be made holy is to find the only thing holy here, which is Christ alone. They sought perfect humanity instead of their unknown God, who was Jesus. The religion of Israel could only produce a Pharisee. The power of Rome produced only Caesar. And the philosophy of the Greeks produced only Alexander the Great, who was an infant at heart. Jesus is the universal man. Everything the Greeks look for, the Jews seek him today. Rome's, I'm sorry, everything the Greeks look for was Jesus. The Jews seek him today, yet he's already come and he's coming again. Rome's power has ceased, and Jesus' name is proclaimed in every corner of the earth. So what was Luke's purpose? Luke wishes to lay the foundation for his defense in the book of Acts, and the full membership of Gentiles as the part of God's people. The reason for the gospel of Luke is he's trying to lay a foundation so that we understand that Gentiles are an understood part of the kingdom of heaven. He also wants us to understand that those who were nothing like him, liked him. Those who were nothing like him, liked him. He talks about it over and over again in the scripture. Jesus is the universal man who lived perfectly in the power of the Holy Spirit as the Son of Man who came to redeem all people. That's the whole point of Luke put into one phrase. Jesus is the universal man who lived perfectly in the power of the Holy Spirit as the Son of Man who came to redeem all people. So, these are the four things you're going to read in Luke over and over and over again. I know this was a teaching. I will preach more. I've spent a lot of time talking about facts. I've studied the mess out of this because I got so enthralled with it. But what really, really hit me was that churches have been built, are built, and are continuously being built by Luke's. We want John's. We like John's. We like Peter's. Because you can either love him religiously or you can despise them continuously. We like Joel Osteen's because everything he said is written down and videoed so we can say whether or not we love or hate him. Let's take a vote. I'm kidding. Don't do that. We like the John Hagees. We put him up on a pedestal. When the Jimmy Swaggarts fall, half of his followers do, and we revel in it. I knew he was nothing. 
We like putting people up, but I'm going to tell you, real church is done by the Lukes, by the unsung heroes. We'll never forget the name. I hope we never forget the name Snow White and R.O. Denton. But people around the world won't know that name. It's the gospel takers, the people who go to the places nobody else is going to. It's the people who would ever think, let's plant a church in Askeyville. Buna Vesta. We don't even know how to say it right. <laughs> who would think that's the place to bring a body? And who could have ever known in just 90 years we would see this body and we would be strategically placed to bring hope to every corner of Bertie County? God did. And he laid it on the heart. Brother Denton, it makes no sense for Brother Denton to come to Askeyville. He's in Eagle Lake. He's right down the street from Disney. And he comes here. That family gives us 50 years. It makes no sense. Snow White. It makes no sense. First of all, if we wanted to be on good foot, and Lord shouldn't have chose a woman, Right? What was God thinking? As Catherine Kuhlman, one of the greatest female ministers in history said, perhaps God had laid it on the heart of 300 other men, but they'd all said no, and she was the only one willing to say yes. I know this to be the case. I'm grateful to God that somebody listened to the call because this place changed my life. You changed my life. I've had dozens of Lukes in my life, and I'm grateful to God. Luke's very name means light, and Luke's gospel is light to the Gentiles. We are those Gentiles. So the four major themes you're going to see over and over again in the book of Luke. Number one, he's going to talk about Jesus as the perfect universal human. In Luke chapter 2, verse 52, it says that Jesus grew in stature. He increased in stature and, and wisdom and in relationship with God and man. Those are the four areas that he saw as necessary for man to grow up. And he said that Jesus grew in all four ways. He's the universal man. He talks about his perfection, his holiness, the fact that he was set apart. He was not like anybody else. He was the universal perfect man. The second thing he is focusing on is that the son came to seek and save the lost. Chapter 19, verse 10, is the story of Zacchaeus. And after Zacchaeus comes out of the... By the way, Zacchaeus isn't in another gospel. He's, the only one that mentions him is Luke. The tax collector up in the tree, you would have thought somebody else would have mentioned that. But they want to leave that out too. God calls him down and says, I'm going to your house. And then, and then uh, Luke summarizes that moment and he says... That he's the son of man who came to seek and save the lost. That's the second major theme of Luke. Aren't you grateful that Jesus comes to seek and save the lost? Is there anybody in this house who's grateful to God that he didn't leave you, but he found you? Who came looking for you? Who, came, who took the time to come find you? Who laid the groundwork so that you would know Jesus? Many of you in this room, it may have been your parents. Praise God for that. Who laid the groundwork for them? Who spoke into the darkness when nobody else would? Who came to seek and save the lost? Thank God for those people. The third was that all people are in. Jesus came to seek and to save the lost. And who were the lost? Anybody who's not with them. That means Gentile and Jew the same. That was the whole point of what Luke wanted us to understand was that Jesus came for everybody. He didn't come for the Jews. As Paul said, the Jews first, the Gentiles second. Luke doesn't even make that argument. Luke says it was for everybody from the very beginning. He says, I, br I come to bring you good news... Of great joy. 
I want great joy in my life, but I know where the good news of getting great joy is, is Jesus Christ. And I know that for the people who are brokenhearted in, down these streets. When people come to tell me it's hard for me to go to church, I'm having a tough time in my life, I'm like, that's the very reason you need to go to church. Not because church makes you happy, but the people who know who Jesus are, they often can help you find Jesus. And if you can find Jesus, you can find great joy because we're promised in Luke chapter 2 that he brings us good news of great joy. Glad tidings is the way we like to say it. Hark the herald angels sing. Glory to the newborn king. He's coming. And it's good news for everybody. You say, not for everybody. What about the people who don't believe? Everybody has the choice to believe. Well, what if they don't hear? Isn't that our problem? If somebody doesn't hear, isn't that on us? How many people do we pass by every single week and we not tell them where to find the faith, hope, and love? We had the most important thing in the world, the gospel, the good news of Jesus. We clutch it to our chests. Me. No more. What if I offend them? Into heaven? What if they don't want to hear it? My Lord, there's a, I promise you there'll be a day they wish they had. And the last one is Luke talks about the need for the Holy Spirit over and over and over and over and over and over again. In Luke's understanding, the Holy Spirit is the equalizer between the Jews and the Greeks. The Jews and the Gentiles. He knew that if the Holy Spirit would fall on the Gentile just like he fell on the Jew, then that was God's stamp. That was God's seal that the Gentiles were brought in just like the Jews were. Now listen, I know nobody in this room is wondering about that. Everybody in your room, this, you're settled on the fact that you're allowed into God's family. I get that. But what I want you to understand today is that if without Luke, you wouldn't have a leg to stand on. Without the gospel of Luke, without the understanding of the early church in Acts, we're not even brought into the game till Acts chapter 10. If Luke has a heart attack on, on Acts chapter 9, we don't get in. Now obviously God lets us in. But we got something to be thankful for. Thank God for Luke. Thank God for a Greek, for a Gentile who saw it necessary to write an account, an orderly account of the things that Jesus did so that we know we have a way in. Thank you for joining the Askewville Assembly of God Sermon Podcast. For more information on our ministry, please visit our website at askewilleassembly.com.